Praise God. Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. Always good to be in the house of the Lord. Go ahead and be finding uh, with me in your Bibles tonight, uh, Luke chapter 7. We're going to be in Luke chapter 7 tonight, and uh, we will begin reading at the 11th verse. When you find that, you can stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 11. We're going to read two verses here, 11 and 12. Luke chapter 7, verse 11, this is what it says. And it came to pass the day after that he went into the city, speaking of Jesus, called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. You may be seated tonight. I've titled the message, Two Crowds. Two Crowds. We'll be looking at two crowds of people tonight. And uh, as I was preparing this message, looking over, you know, I've got these notes here. And I was praying, and uh, as, I, as I look at this, I realize that all it is is just a skeleton in words unless the Holy Spirit begins to minister to hearts and lives. And so I prayed that he would do that tonight. You know, I look at uh, the feeding of the 4,000 and 5,000, and, and sometimes you look at what's in your hands and you just say, Lord, it, it's not enough, but I just, I give it to you, and in your hands it will be enough. You can feed multitudes if God's in it. And uh, so I love, uh, there's a few things that I want to mention as we look at this, I want you to notice that there are multitudes in procession. There are multitudes in procession. Look at verse 11, 11 again. It says, He went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Look at verse 12. There was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. So we have first, we have much people with Jesus. We also have much people with this widow, and uh, the dead son is being carried out. We have two multitudes of people. They're much different. On the one hand, you have the Son of God who's coming out with his disciples and much people, and, and on on the other hand, you have a widow that's weeping for her dead son. And uh, so I want you to notice that there are two processions that are going on here. There are two different crowds of people. Now, number one, I want you to notice the procession of life. You find that in the, in the 11th verse where it talks about Jesus and many of his disciples are, are coming with him. There's much people. See, with Jesus, there is, there is life. There is, there is joy in that crowd. I thought about what it would be like as I was reading these scriptures, what it would be like to have been in that that crowd with Jesus. I, I can't quite a, a, a picture exactly what it would be, but, but I really, I think it'd be a lot like coming to church because when you're in church, the presence of God is here. You're among God's people. There's joy. There's, there's laughter. You're, you're uh, enjoying the fellowship with others that, that love Jesus. There, I think it would be like as if, if when you come to church, that's the kind of uh, the crowd that it would be. The Bible talks about Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness. He wasn't sad. He wasn't going around uh, worrying about the the cross he was coming to. He was looking forward to paying the price for each one of us. Uh, there was a crowd of joy. This, this crowd, this first one is a procession of life. These people are proceeding in life. They have the master. They have the Lord Jesus there with them. How amazing would it be to be in that crowd? Amen? Amen. Think about what that would be like. And then on the other hand, now we take a look at the other multitude. This is a procession of death. You find that this, uh, this mother, she has her dead son and they're carrying him out of the city for burial and there's much people with her. There's a great crowd of people with her and there's weeping and there's sadness. This crowd is one that is full of grief. It is full of sorrow. They're taken in, uh, in sadness. They're mourning. They, they have a sense of hopelessness about them. Their joy has departed. Now that doesn't sound anything like the first crowd, does it? That doesn't sound anything like the one with Jesus. But yet this widow, she has much people with her. And her crowd is this sense of sorrow and this grief and this, this hopelessness. Not only that, but this is doubly sad because her husband is dead. And now her only son. 
There's just grief. There's, there's first, there's the husband and now her only son. No doubt she is totally hopeless. She is bound in grief. She is sorrowing. I want you to know first uh, that so it is with the world. So it is that the, the world is full of sorrow. The world is full of grief. There, there are two crowds and they're contrasting here and they're, and they're getting ready to meet. There are two different ones. On the one there's life and there's joy and there's victory and there's probably singing and, and shouting. There's happiness that's there and the other is sorrow and weeping and grief. Now, I want you to notice that the procession of death is interrupted by the procession of life. There's, there's an interruption that takes place. They're, they're coming in from two different directions, and suddenly there is a convergence that happens. Look at verse 13 and 14. It says, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the buyer, and they that bare him stood still. Now there's four things that I want to take a look at with this. The procession of death is interrupted. Number one is interrupted by compassion. It is interrupted by compassion. Look at verse 13 again. It says, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Now, I want you to think about something just for a minute. It doesn't appear that this widow solicited any help from Jesus. It doesn't appear that she, if, if she did, it doesn't say that. It doesn't appear that she did at all. Here these two crowds are coming and it doesn't appear that she, that she asked for Jesus to do anything but, but yet this is such a, a wonderful thing about Jesus and his great love and compassion. He sees her and he has compassion on her. Didn't he do that for you and I? When he looks at us and he sees that you have a need and he has compassion on us. With his great love, he looks at us with love and compassion and he realizes there's a need that needs to be met even if we don't understand fully what he's able to do about it. Think about this woman that, that is coming out in this procession of death, but it's interrupted when Jesus arrives. It's interrupted by, by, uh, by compassion. Over and over in the scriptures, we see that Jesus has compassion on people. He, he looks at people with compassion and love. He's moved with compassion to help people. And so he is with you and I. You know that, that God is faithful. His mercies endure forever. He is faithful to you and I. I love what it says in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. Listen to what it says. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The wonderful thing about those compassions, not only are they new every morning, but they're still fresh in the evening. Right now, they're still just as fresh right now as they were this morning when you woke up. But the amazing thing is, when you go to sleep tonight, if the Lord tarries his coming, you'll wake up with a whole new fresh set of God's mercies and his compassion. How wonderful is that? Amen. <laughs> Amen. But we look at verse 13 again. He had compassion on her. Look at what he says. He says to her, weep not. Now I want you to take just a moment and think about this. Here is this funeral procession that's coming out. This crowd of happy people shows up and interrupts this. Whether or not she knew about Jesus, I don't know. But here... Jesus says, weep not. Now, could you imagine that maybe that widow in that moment looked at her son laying in that casket and said, what do you mean, weep not? Could she maybe have done that? Could she maybe have looked at her son in that and said, uh, what do you mean, weep not? I've got every reason in the world to weep. My husband's dead. My son's dead. We're taking him out to bury him today. And you're saying, don't weep. Don't cry about it. I've got every reason. That may have been very difficult to receive. That may have been very, very difficult to receive. She could have looked at that, yet Jesus says, weep not. And I thought about this. We look at our circumstances sometimes and we say, I've got every reason to weep. I've got every reason to be sorrowful. I've got every reason because of the pains that I'm in. I've got every reason because of the grief that I'm in. But Jesus says to us, weep not. But why? He says, weep not. Listen, he says, weep not. But our circumstances says we should. And rightly so. 
There was a reason to be weeping. There was, a re there was a reason to be sorrowful. But that's the amazing thing about Jesus is he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. There are things that he recognizes that he can do that we don't always realize what he's about to do. And so we look at our circumstances and says, I've got every reason to weep. I've got every reason to sorrow. I've got every reason to doubt, to fear, to worry. Uh, have you seen the heartbreaks that I'm in? Have you seen these things? But you can hear the blessed Savior say to tonight weep not because he's able to do amazing things I want you to think about this he is now now number two he is, this uh, this procession of death is interrupted by the presence of life it's interrupted by the presence of life let's look at verses 13 and 14 again. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. Listen to those three words in verse 14. And he came. Now, Jesus doesn't just tell us, don't cry about it. He doesn't just say, you know, get over it. He doesn't just say, you've got a problem. This isn't a rebuke. This is compassion that Jesus has toward this woman. He's saying, weep not. And Jesus doesn't just tell us, well, don't worry about it. Don't sorrow about it. He comes to our aid. See, Jesus does something about it. He does something about it. He doesn't just say, don't cry about it. Don't weep. He says, I'm going to do something about it. And so he comes and Jesus came. And I want you to know that when Jesus came, he began the process of turning weeping into shouting. There's a scripture that says weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And when Jesus comes, you may be weeping. You may be in sorrow. You may have every reason to. But when Jesus comes and he looks at you with compassion, you can say, oh, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Jesus is here. Jesus is came. He's He's on the scene. He's here to help us. He doesn't just tell me to suck it up. He says, I'm here for you. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Why? Because he came. He cared about us. The scriptures say in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, you know it, but we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Listen, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's that scripture in 1 Peter 5, 7. I love it. Casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. You wonder, does God care? There's your answer tonight. But I want you to realize that the presence of Jesus changed everything. In his compassion, Jesus extended his hand to us, even when maybe we weren't asking for it. His grace... That unmerited favor, that love of Christ Jesus, extended his hand to me when I wasn't asking for it. Because God so loved the world. Think about it. Think about this crowd of sorrow and death. And Jesus sees it. Think about this world and its darkness that it's in right now. Increasing more and more. Is that not the condition of the world? One person carrying another out to burial today, someone else tomorrow. Death has taken hold of this world. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. This world, because of sin, it's wrapped in death. There's, there's death everywhere you look. Preachers all the time talk about how dark it is. It's as dark as they said it is and more. But Jesus comes. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. God so loved this woman. Individually, I said it before, you're never lost in the crowd. God sees you individually in here tonight. And I want you to know that Jesus came to interrupt this proceeding of death. And he came to bring life and compassion to us. He came for us. He loves us. Coming to the next portion. Look at verse 14. 
It says, and he came and touched the buyer. And they that bear him stood still. I want you to know that this procession of death was interrupted by Jesus' touch. He came and touched the buyer. You say, now what is a buyer? Simply this is an open coffin. Another place says, uh, another definition of it is it is a flat wooden frame which a body is carried out of town to the grave. This is a wooden frame that this dead man is, is laid on and carried out. It's either an open top or just a simple wooden frame. So he's on this buyer. And they carry the dead man out. They carry this, this man out on the wooden frame. I want you to realize that the grave had the victory over this man. Wouldn't you agree? The grave had the victory over this man. He was dead. No doubt about it. This man was dead. Yet Jesus has the power to stop the procession of death and to give life back to the dead. Now I want you to think about this. Jesus, he came and he had compassion on the widow. He came and he touched the wooden frame on which the dead man was laid. And he stopped this procession of death. The touch of Jesus stopped it. I want you to realize that Jesus has also done that for us. You think that our procession of death, you realize that Jesus came and tasted death for every man? But we see Jesus made lower than the angels for suffering and death, crowned with glory, glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Jesus did that for you and me. His touch interrupted death. See, Jesus, he took hold of death when he bore his wooden frame to Golgotha's hill. The cross of Calvary, where it should have been ours, yet Jesus took that. He touched it and said, I'll take this for them. And he gives us life and he goes and he stops the procession of death. Why? Because he didn't stop his. He didn't stop his. <laughs> Think about the fact that they, bear, they that bear him stood still. So you have this dead man being carried out and those, those that are carrying him. And uh, I'm reminded the law says the soul that sinneth shall die. The wages of sin is death. The grave had the victory yet Jesus had the power to stop it. To give life back to the dead. Jesus came, he fulfilled the law, and he broke the powers of sin. He died on the cross of Calvary. He didn't stop his death. He willingly laid down his life for us in our place. And the grave could not hold him. He rose again from the grave victorious over death. He stopped those that was carrying us to the graveyard. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I like to think about it like this. Jesus, hooked, he took hold of death by allowing death to take hold of him. The only problem was is death couldn't hold him. <laughs> yeah, he took hold of death by allowing it to take hold of him, but it could not hold him. Glory to God. <laughs> Praise God. Those that bear him stood still. I'm reminded of the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57. Listen to what it says. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, which gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Amen. Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. And what did he do? He took those keys and locked me out that I don't ever have to go there. I get eternal life because Jesus shed his own blood for me. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's so good. It was the touch of Jesus. I want you to look at number four. He came, it, it, this procession of death was interrupted by his command. Look at verses 14 and 15 again. And he came and touched the buyer, that wooden frame. They that bear him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up. And he began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Now, how wonderful it is that even death must obey the command of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is the ultimate authority. He's God Almighty. What he says goes. If death says this one's mine, Jesus says, no, it's not, it's mine. How about that? <laughs> Jesus says, this is mine. And he stops his procession of death and he, and he gives his wonderful command and he says, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And the man sits up. <laughs> That's so wonderful. He returns him. He delivers him to his mother. Now think about this. How wonderful would that reunion have been right then? Wow, how wonderful is that reunion right then? And can you think about that day, someday when Jesus, he returns for us and there is a reunion that's going to take place with those, with the loved ones that we love that have gone before. They're not here right now, but, but his dad says they're awake up there. They're sleeping down here. They're awake up there. And God's going to bring all those back with him and he's going to call us up to meet them in the clouds of glory. We're going to be with Jesus forevermore. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's that's a reunion I'm ready for. Glory to God. There's coming a reunion because Jesus stopped the procession of death. He took hold of death. He said, no, you're not going to take these. I'm calling out a church. They're mine. I have uh, shed my own blood for them. I died on the cross. I rose again from the grave. He says, death, you're not in charge anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God, you're not in any charge anymore. Hallelujah, there's going to be a reunion someday. The book of Hebrews talks about we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Think about all those that you know in your own lifetime. But think about the church, the centuries that have gone. That is an amazing cloud. It's coming with him. Wow. Cheering us on in the grandstands of heaven, just waiting for that glorious reunion. Oh, hallelujah. I want you to notice that the reason for the procession has been removed. The reason for this funeral has been removed. Look at verse 15 again. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. <clears throat> that guy's not dead anymore. <laughs> the guy's not dead anymore. Have you, I don't, I've never seen anybody dead sit up and start talking. And if I did, <laughs> yeah. The dead man, he sat up and began to speak. He's not dead anymore. The funeral's over at that point. <laughs> there's, no, there's no point. The funeral is over at that point. Dead people don't talk. That'd be really distracting when you're trying to bury this guy and he's talking, you know, he's, he's sitting up and said, this is not going to work. This is just not going to work. But, but I want you to realize that the death was, was powerless at the command of Jesus. The whole reason for it was removed. Think about that. Yeah. We've been given that victory over death. Through Jesus Christ on the cross, sure, physically, if the Lord tarries his coming, we live in a fallen, sinful world, we will die, but we don't have to die spiritually. And I believe that we'll be that generation that is never going to die, that Jesus is coming back to take us home. I want you to know that that enemy has been defeated. Now, as we come to the, to the conclusion of this message... I want you to realize that there was evidence of life, undeniable evidence of life. We started out with two crowds. We started out with the dead crowd. We started out, uh, we had the living crowd. We had the, with the ones that were in sorrow and grief. We had the ones that were happy and joyful. And Jesus comes and he interrupts it. And he interrupts it with compassion and his presence and his touch and his command. The reason is gone for the funeral. And now here he is, there's evidence of life. Look at verse 15 again. He that was dead sat up and began to speak. Now this is the case when Jesus gives us life, when he puts life in us, when we're born again, it will show. We all were dead in our trespasses and sins, but Jesus came when we put our trust in Jesus Christ and his shed blood at Calvary. We all have that assurance. And what do we do? We set up. There's a new life. 
There's something different about us. We stand up. We begin to speak the testimony, what Jesus has done in our life. Look at that. It says he began to speak. Not only is the life visible by the fact that we stand up, that, that we sit up, we're not the same that we used to be, but our language is different. We begin to speak. We begin to testify of the glory of God, of the things that he's done in our life, of the transformation that has happened inside of us. We once were dead, but now we're alive in Christ Jesus. His life is in us. The blood of Jesus is is flowing through our lives he's given us life I want you to notice the next part that he delivered him to his mother now here's here's another evidence of life this man returned to his mother returned to his city no doubt but he didn't return the same way that he left the city I thought you know what maybe he was even carrying his wooden frame with him you remember this How about that? He might have been carrying that little wooden frame with him and said, I used to be laying on this. Do you realize this? I used to be the guy that was on that. Yeah, you guys was probably crying for me. Now look at me. I met Jesus. How about that? <laughs> there's an undeniable, there's, a, there's the evidence of life. It's clear. Everyone around it's going to see that that life is in you. The life of Jesus is in you. The testimony is on your lips. The praise is on your lips. You desire to see other people changed and, and transformed because of the life that Jesus has put inside of you. Look at verses 16 and 17. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that, that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. And that was truer, really, than they realized, because this is Almighty God in the flesh here. And he's doing these things. Uh, God has visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. The testimony, listen, the testimony in our life should, uh, should be clear and evident to everyone that God has done something inside of us. If you're the same thing you've always been, you're not something new. If you're the same thing you've always been, you've never been born again. If any, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. If any man not be in Christ, he's the same old creature that he's always been. Nothing has changed. All things remain the same if you're not in Christ. But if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Everything is different. All things have been changed. You're a totally new person. And it will be evident in your actions. It will be evident in your speech. It will be clear. And everyone will have to look at it and say, that was the dead man carried out, but now he's a living man walking back into the city telling me about Jesus, someone that transformed his life and gave him a new life. <laughs> That's so amazing. It's a testimony. Now, as we come to the, to the conclusion, I've said that I think three times now. Somebody may have been counting. I don't know. What crowd do you belong in? I want you to uh, examine your, your surroundings. What crowd are you in? What marks your circumstances? Has there never been a change in your life? You're not born again. The Bible says, Jesus says, you must be born again. You must put your Trust in Jesus Christ shed blood. If you're going to jump out of an airplane, don't just admire the parachute. You put the parachute on, you jump out of the airplane and trust, I'm going to land. Right? Don't just admire Jesus Christ tonight. Don't just admire what he's done. You've got to put it on. Put on the blood of Jesus. Allow yourself to be covered in the blood of Jesus. Put your full trust in what he's done for you. You must repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to turn from your sins. You can't have it both ways. You can't stay a sinner and expect that the kingdom of heaven is yours. Jesus went saying, repent. If Jesus said it, I mean, he's the one that writes the instructions. You've got to repent. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him transform you into a new creature in Christ Jesus. What he will do, he will take that sorrow, 
that morning. Now, Christians still have trouble. Don't get me wrong. The Christians still have trouble. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's what the Bible says. But I'm talking about your dead, sin-bound life that you live in. Jesus can take that and transform you and give you peace and joy and life and happiness that is not of this world. He can do that for you. He can take that. I, I, I looked at a scripture in Psalms 30, and, as, uh, and this is the last one I have for you tonight. In Psalms 30, verse 11 and 12, listen to what it says. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Turn my mourning into dancing. Brought me up out of the miry clay and you set my feet upon the rock and you established my goings and put a new song in my mouth. Even a song of praise to God and many will see that as many as I can. He turned my mourning into dancing. Now, doesn't that sound like a better life? <laughs> doesn't that sound like a better life to you? There'll be a day where you're going to meet Jesus. You'll meet him one way or the other. You'll either meet him covered in the blood or you'll meet him trampling over top of it. Because you didn't regard the sacrifice that he made for you. So tonight, two crowds, we're going to give an invitation. Two crowds, examine your heart. you got to repent and trust Jesus. You can't just live the same life. But Jesus doesn't just tell you, weep not. He does something about it. And I want to tell you, he did something about your sin problem. He did something about the problem that you have. He's able to deliver you from it. He's able to do it. The life of Christ is evident in people all over this room. You say, I've never seen Jesus. Well, I've seen Jesus. I see him in my dad. I see him in Brother Daryl. I could go across this room all over this place. I see Jesus living out right out here in broad daylight. You ask him, there's a testimony on their lips. Me and Brother Ward was talking about that just the other day. We wouldn't trade the life prior to this for anything in the world of what Jesus has given us now. There ain't nothing worth it. You're not going to miss out on anything coming to Jesus except for hell. Coming to Jesus, you're going to miss out on punishment. I want to pray and then we'll open these altars. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you for your sweet spirit in this place. Lord, I thank you for the cross that you didn't stop your procession of death. Lord Jesus, you freely laid down your life for me. And for every single person in here or that may hear it whenever, however, Lord Jesus, the word says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if there's someone in here tonight, I know that if they're repenting in their heart and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. Your word declares it. So, Father, I pray that you would hear them. I know you will. Lord, minister to every heart in here. Help us to examine ourselves and realize that you have the solution to our problem. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and stand with me. These altars are open for you. Whatever your need may be, bring it to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.